the organization of this conference. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm here, <laughs> but they asked me to present Alan Kay. And first of all, he, he's, he invented the future. Okay? The future was uh, personal computing, and as a side effect, we have small work. And that's why we are happy to be here and to listen to this genius. And he will not talk about small talk. He will just talk about something. We don't know about what. And uh, I invite you to enjoy very much listening to this guy who began thinking about how to improve cognitive skills for children at the primary school. And that's why we have personal computing and small talk. And that's it. Just add it. configuration a little bit 
and that might uh, cause a glitch in one little place. I didn't have a chance to test it, but uh, let me uh, just start by saying thank you for inviting me to your conference, and I'm so glad to be able to do this with electrons rather than uh, atoms because uh, traveling is more difficult for me now than, than it used to be. And um, I've always had a little bit of a difficulty knowing what to say to people who are interested in small talk. So um, I'm decided I would try to do something that is kind of a modern version of, of what I said at the very first Uppsala, uh, which I think happened in, I don't know, the latter part of the 80s. So small talk uh, had been out for a while uh, commercially, and people had been using it, and quite a bit of the first Uppsala was, was about small talk. So um, the context at uh, at Xerox Park was what we used to call the Wayne Gretzky theory of the future. And Wayne Gretzky was a uh, one of the, maybe the greatest hockey player of all time. And he was just a little guy like me. Um, and uh, didn't play very much. Um, but he was incredibly effective compared to most of the other hockey players. And they asked him, about this, and he, and he said, well, a uh, good hockey player goes to where the puck is. And we think of that in the context that this talk is being news. Where the puck is and where it's going to be a few seconds from now is kind of incremental on some state that we understand very, very well and easily. And uh, he said, but a, a great hockey player goes where the puck is going to be. And he didn't mean the puck is going to be over there, uh, you know, eight seconds from now. He meant, given the whole context of where the players are, sometime in, in the future, I can see that the defense will be over here and my people will be over here. So if I get over here, somebody can pass me the puck and then I can shoot a goal. And that's what happened over and over again. But he wasn't reasoning from the incremental state of things, but he was actually trying to imagine some future state and what conditions would produce it so he could be most effective with it. And so I'm just going to call that new. That is the principle of new as compared to new. It involves uh, things that you haven't for things that are not easily derivable from, from what we have right now. And, and of course, at Xerox Park, now uh, next year will be 40 years ago, uh, this first computer that was like a Mac uh, started working. And it wasn't like the first Mac, which had a tiny little screen, but it was actually like the Macintoshes of the late 80s. So this machine was perhaps 15 years ahead, and uh, that was our aim, was to get 10 to 15 years ahead of Moore's Law by being able to pay. So this cost a lot, this machine cost a lot more than a, than a real Mac uh, did later on. Cost about maybe a factor of 12 or 14 more than an active when it first, first came out. But all of a sudden we were living in the future and we could start doing things like uh, uh, inventing the user interface, um, inventing desktop publishing, busy with interactions, and, and so forth. And the cool thing about this was that the uh, hardware and the software were designed together. And in fact, the software plan was done before we built the hardware. So the hardware was actually built to optimize the software that we wanted to build. So this is sort of exactly the opposite of your experience 
where Intel does whatever it wants to do, and then programmers are supposed to make it uh, look better. Whereas here we actually have some aims and had done a bunch of experiments, and we had a sense of how we wanted to program this thing, and so we built a, a computer that was an ideal receptacle for the various higher level languages that we did part. One of those is small talk. And so our version of personal computing as it appeared uh, maybe 1977 or so, after many, many uh, experiments, uh, is kind of what you're looking at here, uh, was about 10,000 lines of small talk. And it included all of small talk as we used to today in what is still called the, the image. Although we didn't call it the image back then for a while because small talk was simply the operating system of this computer. It started out as a standalone com computer hooked together with Ethernet. Even and what the image was was simply uh, the entire address space that was going to be used, and including uh, what we had instead of an operating system and, and uh, what we had instead of C and so forth. And uh, for about five years, um, this system was, I think, by far the best way to do programming on the planet. It was just like magic. And then, of course, there were time uh, opportunities for changing and stuff, and small talk didn't change very much because it had gotten useful. And so I'll just show you a couple of things that we thought about. One, one thing was for sure, once you went to a viable set of networks, you really didn't want to have the image anymore because all of the, essentially the, all of the things that you wanted to work with were now uh, fitting into a network rather than just the uh, single memory of a standalone machine. And so uh, one of the ideas was to have these virtual computers that were small talk objects or objects made in other systems that were basically virtual virtual uh, computers that they would basically float over the network. And so the, the different kinds of computers you might have on the, uh, on the network would just be caches. And each, uh, each one of these virtual computers would have code hooks for the different kinds of computers and so you could move them from one to another uh, without interrupting the actual computing they were doing. And we actually experimented with that because we did about seven different kinds of personal computers over the eight or nine years at Jock's Park. And each one of them had a different microcode. And so the by the time 77, 78 rolled around, a small talk image had three or four microcode uh, hooks to contain the microcode for all the different machines we had apart, and then you could get an image off the server, and it would load into whatever machine we were sitting at, whether it was an Alto or a uh, Gelato or a Dolphin, and uh, it would compute it identically uh, to uh, the way it would compute on any other machine. And we realized that this could actually allow for this floating computation idea um, but, and now the image actually would be the, the entire internet, which we're also working on. And in fact, we have some uh, really good inspiration for this. And then the, then the idea is, on the machine you happen to be sitting at, the job of the model views and controllers thing that we had back then would simply be an intermediary that would combine uh, graphical and other kinds of sensory material from however many uh, of these processes that you had in the machine that was near to you. And if you had this enormous computation, it didn't have to be in the same machine because parts of it would be distributed 
around the, the network. So this is a pretty good scheme. Uh, we never did it. Park actually um, deteriorated uh, around the time we were starting to think about this stuff. Uh, Park Close was set up as a way of getting small talk sort of out of Xerox and, and uh, more out into the world. But if you think about it, this is a pretty good way of doing things because we, we already have gotten rid of applications. You just had useful objects on multiple uh, things that would be called desktops today. We thought of them more as pages in a multimedia system. And every time you made a new, new useful object, it could actually be integrated graphically. So you get this ever-growing uh, collection of useful, useful things to make uh, communications with. And in today's terms, the web would be much simpler. Because one of the big flaws of the web is they didn't realize that it wasn't an application. The web is really a kind of a mini operating system. And the job of the web browser should be to do as little as possible. Basically just run computation from the outside uh, blindly and uh, safely. And then use something like a model views controller scheme to get the images from these things up on the screen. That way you don't have to worry about whether it's HTML 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, or whether even after all of that it still doesn't have the features you need or any of those things. You just have something that is like uh, your personal computer itself, whose job it is is to run any kind of code safely and let you see it on the screen. So the web didn't do that, and it's a shame because after 19 years, it still hasn't caught up to the computers that it's been, that it's been implemented on. So this is terrible, but it's, it's just the way it goes. There's some in inspirations here for people who are interested in this. Uh, Dave Reed at MIT in the late 70s proposed an architecture for the centralized operating system for the internet that had many of these ideas and distributed computations. Uh, it's worthwhile reading, even today. Uh, an example of this was actually done by Jerry Popek, who was a visitor at Park for a year uh, and a professor at UCLA. So he did it with Unix processes. And this book, for anybody who's interested, is still one, has still one of the best discussions about this in the first few chapters. MIT Press, called The Locust Distributed System Architecture. And so what this thing could do, and I tried to get Apple to buy it, but uh, they weren't interested. So what, what it could do is have uh, different machine types of Macintoshes, PCs, PDP-11s, and a few other things. Unix operating system. Uh, then the idea is the Unix processes, just like small talk objects, had their own code hooks. And with the same kind of mechanisms you would use to provide safe interrupts, uh, this locus system could, on the fly, redistribute these processes around the network uh, to balance the computations, and it could do it while it was running the computation. And when you got to the new machine, if it had a different processor, it would just go to that code hook that started up from the from the place that had been suspended when it had been set. So Popec wound up making a lot of money with this because he took it into companies like Net Zero and it was used there for uh, for many years. But Apple didn't buy it and it never got into the zeitgeist of personal computer. So this is a 30-year-old idea now that uh, would be very useful today. If you think about the problems with mobile computing, what you really want is an architecture kind of like this, and on your mobile computer, which may have fewer resources, you'd have fewer of these objects in the mobile computer itself. But the computation would be the same, so there wouldn't be different computations uh, for the same kind of services from machine to machine. And more recently, over the last 10 years or so, Dave Smith and uh, some of us at viewpoints did a distributed system called Croquet, which was done in Spook Smalltalk and uh, became a startup and is a, is a foundation. So these ideas are kind of waiting around now for 40 uh, years 
from when small talk was king, uh, every couple of years, to this era of the last 30 years where small talk has not materially changed uh, since it came out of pot. So this is what I talked to the original Utsla audience about. So, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is a learning curve. We don't really know how to do opportunity programming yet. And so every time you learn something, you can implement a new version of the thing until we get an architecture that is not just expressive, but can also scale. And um, the small talk architecture is somewhat expressive, but it doesn't scale very well for a variety of reasons. I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a second. And so even in the late 80s, uh, I was asked by Dan Ingalls to complain to the Utsla audience that, hey, uh, you're treating small talk like a regular programming language done by some gods in some vendor company, and uh, all you've got to do is program it. But in fact, it's a, it's a language set up for making languages, and uh, it's not the last word in programming. So you should actually be making languages in it to make your programming more expressive, and by the way, you should be changing it every few years also. So this is hardly been done. And uh, it's probably the most disappointing thing about small talk um, history over the years. Okay, now going back 50 years, I've shown you a slide of a uh, um, guy we call Lick, JCR Lick Rider, who was the original funder of all of the stuff that led eventually to personal computing and the internet. And uh, uh, Xerox Park and small talk and graphics displays and everything. This, this guy was the guy who uh, was a psychologist who got given the money by ARPA in the early 60s, and he was a very wise man. So he put out this money wisely because he wanted to invent a new paradigm. He wanted to invent what he called the destiny of computers, as he says here, to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for all people universally networked worldwide. And when anybody asked him what he was doing, he would always say that sentence. And, they would, they, and people would say, well, how are you going to do it? He says, I don't know. I'm going to find smart people, and they will figure out how. So this is the quintessential uh, way a funder should be. They, they don't exist today, at least in the US. Funders will always think they have ideas as good as uh, the people are funding, which is absolutely not true. You think about whose job is doing what. Funders' jobs are accumulating money and dispensing it. Where are they going to get ideas from? So Rick Leiter had it down. He knew what it was, what he was doing when he was funding, and his job was to find smart ideas and smart people. And he didn't care if they agreed or not, because his idea was some conglomeration of smart people working on this vision. Uh, if uh, something good is going to happen, that's just exactly what did happen. But here's a, uh, uh, a memo that he wrote in 1963. So we're going to have the 50th anniversary of this uh, next year. And you notice that it's addressed to the members and the affiliates of the Intergalactic Chief of Computer Network. And if you wonder what the internet was called before it was called the internet, this is what it was called, the Intergalactic Computer Network. And they asked, look, why do you call it that? And he said, well, engineers always do the minimum. Because I can't convince anybody uh, today that we're going to network every single person on the planet. Maybe including all the dogs and cats. <laughs> but he just didn't get it. So he came up with this grandiose title the Intergalactic Computer Network, and that's what we got. Um, and the reason he did this is because he wanted to force people out of trying to do it the way that Bell Telephone did it. It was not a very scalable way, and it's also an extremely expensive way. So which one is a relatively inexpensive way of going many orders of magnitude beyond, uh, beyond what AT&T has done? And then in the middle of this memo, he has this line, where he says, if we succeed in making an intergalactic network, then our main problem will be learning to communicate with aliens. And 
He go, goes on in this memo. This memo is avail available online, by the way. So he goes on in this thing. He tells about what he means by aliens. Of course, uh, he didn't just mean talking, communicating with people on other parts of the network. He meant communicating with programs on other parts of the network. He meant communicating, programs communicating with programs. And one of the examples he uses is that he's sitting on a huge air defense computer in El Segundo doing statistics for some psychological experiment that he did and he needs a package that isn't available to him in Jovial, which is an old Aldo 58 type language. But he knows that it's available at MIT and Fortran and there's a telephone line between uh, the C32 computer in El Segundo and the CTSS system at MIT. So he can you could actually get this uh, program over the telephone, except Jovial doesn't know how to talk to Fortran. And uh, the computers are incompatible, and so even if you get the Fortran <coughs> program, uh, you can't run it on the C32, and the C32 didn't have Fortran on it at the time, and so forth. So, so he nailed something that if we look at the world from the standpoint of today, uh, his community that he set up was able to give him the intergalactic network, but we managed to avoid solving the problem of communicating with aliens. Because this is hardly advanced today from, yeah, maybe Stoke does a few things, but this is hardly advanced today from where things were 50 years ago. This is one of the hard problems in doing something beyond simple protocols, uh, wonderful protocols like TCP IP, but still very simple as far as simple partly because they have nothing to say to each other uh, except take this, please. So if you think about what Rick was saying and if you think about the previous slides that I showed, in order to make this stuff work over the internet scale, the communications between these virtual machines has to act as well as like communications uh, between the elements. Like who knows where one of these things comes from. And so there has to be something that is like a semantic link with Franca developed that, uh, that allows programs that have been uh, organized to run on various different machines to nonetheless be used by each other. And, you know, signature mapping in Java isn't going to do it. It has nothing to do, really, with, the, with what the actual problem is. So here's something from 50 years ago that is still waiting to be, to be done. I always uh, hope that people who are interested in small talk would try and take it to the next level, but most people haven't. Okay, so one way of looking at what our problem is, is that as human beings, for most of our existence on the planet, uh, we could hardly do anything but tactics. We have to struggle every day. We have to find food. We didn't have agriculture yet. So pretty much everything we did was tactical. And uh, it was even hard, I think, to think about what strategies might mean. And a perfect example is to take the good old brick from 5,000 years ago, and think about if you have a brick, things come to mind like piles and stacks of bricks and big versions of these are pyramids and walls and roads. But people built these kinds of simple combinations for thousands of years before anybody thought to do something strategically with a brick. And an example of, this, uh, of a strategic way of using a brick is instead of trying to build with the brick directly, can we use the brick, brick to make something that acts as a much stronger building material for things that are out of the scale of bricks? And so, of course, one example is the arch, which took thousands of years for people to think of. And part of, it, part of the reason for it was that in order to make an arch, you have to put up more things that are there than when you get done. So you put up the scaffolding, you put the things over the top, and 
Once you put the keystone in, you can take the scaffold in the way, and there's the arch. Uh, very, very strong and without a lot of material in it. And so this kind of thinking is just not natural to human beings. And there's usually some idiot around who want uh, some new thing done yesterday. And this almost forces people into a situation where they have to use the kind of thinking that they already have, rather than spending a few years uh, thinking strategically. Now, one of the hallmarks of this funding that Licklider did was he funded people to find problems, not just to solve them. So this idea of problem finding is actually a strategic act, and it's one of the simplest ways of telling whether you have good funders or not. If they will let you spend a few years looking for different characterizations um, that uh, could take you into a different space, rather than just having to use the same old stuff and do problem solving, then you've got a good funder. Okay, so, so one of the best things that was ever invented for thinking strategically is the way science goes about things. And one way of thinking about science is it's, a, it's about hairballs. This is my favorite hairball. It's from the stomach of a woolly mammoth. Um, it's a big hairball. And now that I've got your attention, I'll replace it with the star in heaven because that's nicer to look at than a hairball from a woolly mammoth. So basically it's the same thing. Some mystery, something that uh, we can make up stories about, but it's hard to understand what's actually going on. And especially since we have tiny little brains and uh, we have limited means of expressing ideas. We have various forms of language, pictorial and verbal, symbolic languages, and all of those can be uh, constructed by using a single logical primitive here, so that's our brick. And when things are going well in science, we can make a t-shirt of language that will generate some of the same phenomena as we've been observing out there. It's, only a, it's, it's not a pure explanation because we can only deal with phenomena. And so the, what science is actually about is not, um, is not the t-shirt, but science is the relationship between the phenomena and the representations we can make. And so uh, the, these representations are a kind of simulation of phenomena, and what we're interested in is how good are the, how good are the simulations. And so the cool thing is once we have this way of looking at phenomena and making models of them to understand it better, we can turn these methods onto human made things, like a brick. And so here's a, a rope bridge, and this can be studied just as though nature made it, and uh, we can make a t-shirt about bridges. And here's why it's really great to live in the 20th and the 21st century, is because once we make a t-shirt about bridges, it captures the idea of bridges, we can turn that back into engineering and make a heck of a brick. So just to give you an idea of how big this bridge is, uh, here's the Empire State Building and the Great Pyramid of Egypt. This is the largest suspension bridge in, in the world, and the center span there is almost a mile, more than a kilometer of free span. And that little boat down there is actually a uh, super tanker. So, um, so what we've got here is a yin and a yang between the way of thinking strategically by making models of things, and then we have engineering which gets incredibly enriched from what we can find out with science. So, in the early days, um, I don't think of them as early because this is when I was starting 50 years ago, the early 60s. Um, one of the questions was, well, could there be a computer science? And uh, Alan Perlis, who uh, was one of the uh, designers of Aldol and was set up the department at Carnegie Mellon University, 
So yeah, and it's the science of processes, not the science of looking at computers. Because that's too small an idea. What what we're really interested in computer science is uh, is processes of all kinds, and we want to study those and make models of processes. So we should have called it process science. So we remove a lot of the confusion uh, about what this stuff is about. And uh, 50 years ago, there were some awfully smart people, uh, including Perlis, thinking, here's John McCarthy, and so he looked at all this and came up with his version of the t-shirt for what uh, hardware and software computing was. And uh, this is uh, this is the, uh, the one page uh, evaluated for lift, fits nicely on a t-shirt, and this is with the models you can make with bridges that are more interesting, more fruitful than, than most uh, actually fabricated bridges. Um, McCarthy's model for lift was more fruitful than hardware architectures and Fortran in the 50s. So it was stronger the way of explaining uh, hardware architecture and Fortran, it actually explained more than that, it explained stuff that was actually very illuminating and led to uh, ways of thinking about computing and a mathematical theory of computation and things like small talk. So small talk owes a lot to the way McCarthy thought about this because he was able to take something that was awfully stupidly complicated but not very powerful like Fortran and get it to a place where uh, a single pair of eyes could look at it and contemplate uh, what programming um, might actually mean. And here's the cool thing, is that McCarthy uh, did that t-shirt because he had an even bigger idea a few years earlier. So this paper is worthwhile reading by anybody who's interested in computing. It's called Programs with Common Sense. It was written in 1958 and Almost everything in the paper is still current today. Not a lot has yet been done with it. But he pointed out that uh, in order for computing to expand, uh, we couldn't communicate with the, the computer and machine language, and Fortran wasn't going to do it. So we're kind of just covering up machine language with a few conveniences. But that we're going to actually have to make a uh, uh, a program that could communicate with humans in common sense terms. We call it the advice taker and uh, wrote quite a bit about it. And as he says over here, that the idea of the advice taker is in behavioral behavior is improvable merely by making statements to it, telling about its symbolic environment and what is wanted from it. So uh, then having thought about all this and given a bunch of examples, we then realized, well, there wasn't a good programming language for programming the advice taker, something that was semi-intelligent. And so we had to sit down and get a programming language to do it. That turned out to be less. Watch that. So if we think about this tactics and strategy idea and apply it into computing, again, when we're doing calculators, you get this auto, kind of automatic tactical thing of making better calculating engines. Every once in a while we have a strategic idea like storage program. So the Jakarta Moon back in the um, uh, 1700s. And pretty much the kind of computing we do today, including in small talk, is very, very Jakarta Moon like. Because even though you can hide some of the assignment statements in small talk inside objects, a lot of people think object oriented programming today is using getters and setters, which is actually turning what I thought was a pretty good idea, namely an object, into something that is only a quasi useful idea, which is kind of a fancy data structure. Once you allow an assignment statement from the outside to change state, you actually are, are in a very uh, weak place in trying to build, a, build an architecture because it's to tend to trying to make a cell that admits any virus into it. Just a bad idea. But in spite of that, almost everybody programs this way. And the original design of, of small talk, the idea is that the encapsulation 
should absolutely keep anything like that from happening. You're going to have to do what you do it inside, but from the outside, everything should be driven by goals. So the idea is when you send a message, you're asking for goals to be accomplished. You weren't actually trying to directly change the internal state or something. So this is kind of an abortion that has been going on for, for 30 years. And, but here what we're doing is we're talking about going from an even larger strategic shift which McCarthy suggests is we have to go away from thinking about programming in terms of hows to what. So he said, make an advice taker, make a programming language that's like runnable math, uh, where we can talk in terms of relationships. Then Ivan Sutherland, uh, while everybody was talking about this stuff, Ivan Sutherland made an example uh, when he did Sketchpad. I thought I would show a little bit of this. Um, just to uh, have, you, have you look at uh, what happened 50 years ago. Because this year is the 50th anniversary of Sketchpad. And um, Sketchpad had a number of ideas. It was the first interactive graphics system. Ivan had to actually build the graphics display himself out of the program because uh, all the PXP had on it was an oscilloscope that could plot points. So even the line drawing here was done by, by Ivan. And um, it had a number of ideas. One was the, uh, being able to interact with it directly in a lively fashion. Another one was the idea of instances of master objects. So it was the first software system that I know of that really did this. Uh, in, a, in an absolutely clear way. So everything in Sketchpad was done in terms of classes, and what you saw on the screen were instances of these classes. Much bigger idea was that you didn't program it procedurally, but you actually told Sketchpad what you wanted to have be true, and Sketchpad had three different solvers inside itself that could carry out uh, these uh, uh, constraints or desires that you have. And uh, one of the famous examples, this is where I'm not sure this is going to actually work with the way the, the screen is configured, but let's see if we can make it work. Uh, one of the, the big, big examples uh, is to do a simulation of a bridge, since we're talking about bridges. And what was cool is uh, that I didn't know anything about bridges, and yet in a few minutes you could make a thing that looked like a bridge, and a few more minutes you could make it act like a bridge. Uh, so let's see what, see what happens here. Yeah, okay, so I guess this is going to work. So because this program doesn't exist anymore, we recreated it. So this twinkling that you're, I think you can see the twinkling. Raise your hand if you can see it twinkling. See a twinkling? Yeah. Going like this? Yeah. So that was because it was plotting these points randomly, so it wouldn't make you sick uh, when you look at it. And so uh, you turn on gravity. So now it's calculating the stress and the strain on these beams. And uh, while it was running, you could add in more things. And the stress on this thing is zero. Uh, as soon as I put it into the simulation, though, it changes all the things around it, becomes part of the system. Put in another one. Hang some weights from it. Pretty nice for 62, huh? And this, of course, led to a desire for better displays as we have today. In fact, um, most people shied away from trying to continue on sketch test. So it remains an interesting thing to show 50 years later because there's hardly anything like it. So if we go to the modern world here, now we have modern display and uh, the simulation of sketch test was done by Yoshiki Okima and Bert Poisenberg. And uh, yeah, we can do a few more things uh, now so we can Thank Ivan. <laughs> the 
words have weight. I've been, by the way, getting the Kyoto Prize in Japan in just a couple of days. So uh, nobody deserves it more. And just for fun, we put the uh, program we have to write in order to do this here. It's opening up the wave here. And it basically three things. Here is uh, Galloway and gravity. Here's the spring force on all of the, on all of the beams here. And here's the, um, the Pennington thing. We'll look at that in a second. But what if I take off gravity? So now all we've got is springiness. And all of these guys should settle down to zero. Okay? And we turn it back on again. Now, now we have to ask, what, what do we think is going to happen if we remove the pin? So this is the constraint that pins the beams together. So if I remove that, Goes out, it was just a bunch of pieces. No, no longer a system anymore. Uh, and as small talk as you know, the graphic stuff is just the costume for uh, anything we want to make. So I'm going to repurpose this stuff back into a user interface. And this is a user interface of a system we call Steps. And I, I don't particularly like this uh, steel color. Steel color comes from the, what we use for the bridge. We could try blue. That looks too much like Microsoft. And maybe we go to something Halloween. -y. We just we just had Halloween, and uh, this system is a bit of a Frankenstein monster. And it's, it's not. It's small dot here is actually being used kind of as a cradle for the system. Most of the system is built in other things. I'm going to show you in a second in the time I have left here. And I'm actually doing this presentation in this system. So you can think of this as kind of an adult version of eToys. And all of this is live here. So uh, these are kind of universal documents and we're seeing sort of the authoring view of things here, and we go up to the full screen here. And just to remind ourselves that 60 years ago, in the early 50s, Turing was not only talking about artificial intelligence, but he was also very interested in biology. And I started out as a biologist, and I actually read Turing's paper on morphogenesis, which is the formation of shapes, biological shapes. Uh, that was written, I think, in 52, had a lot of math in it. And he talked about how uh, uh, combinations of gradients, very simple combinations of gradients, could give rise to most of the patterns found in living things. Turned out to be luck. And so here's an example of the X simulation so the ants are finding food and they're leaving a perfume behind. It's about 10,000 patches there that are distributing the perfume. And when an ant, ant wanders into the perfume, it follows the gradient up to the food. So it's very efficient, helping them find the food. And then they go downstream and so forth. And that's an example of a, a pattern that you don't find in the pattern language. Stuff, but it's a pattern that's found everywhere in nature, which is to uh, use gradients of things to help massively parallel things orient in various ways. So, um, so one example here is, uh, if we look at this program for a second, it's actually the program that is doing the layout for the text form of this program. And to give you an idea of what I mean, uh, we treat these things like ants. Okay, so there they go, wandering around. And when I tell them to quit wandering around and do what they're supposed to do, uh, they just follow these three little rules uh, independently, just like the ants do, and the just like Sketchpad does, the conglomeration of these things turns 
what starts as a random system in, into an organized one. So here's, here's what that looks like. So you can see it, they have no, nobody in front of them. You go up to the upper left-hand corner, otherwise you follow. If you go over the, the right margin, then you have to go to the next line. Of course, this is slow, so you can see what, what's going on. Uh, but in fact, uh, we can do it uh, fast. And um, we can also do it in parallel, looking at different ways of solving this problem. So, uh, so what I'm going to turn on here is there are different ways of solving this problem depending on how much elasticity is found in the uh, how these guys hook together. And to make this a little more visible, I'm going to turn on the multiple computation. But you can see they're all being computed at the same time. And we're just picking one or the other here to show how uh, this is something that you know small talk should be doing because we have tons of computing power now. So we shouldn't be hooked into either single pads of control or a simple minded uh, multi-thread. We actually want to be able to do uh, computations, this kind of explorations in the heuristic space that we're, that we're looking at. And, and of course this thing, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is live, so I can, as I move this thing over, I can uh, have this thing be uh, computing for me and show me how this particular simple three-line, three-part program is actually working. This is done by Ted Taylor and Al Aaron Munzer there at the bottom of the, of the screen. Then, of course, uh, you know, we're familiar with BitBlit from Smalltalk, but BitBlit was interesting a long time ago, um, but it's not really up to the standards of personal computer graphics. Uh, and yet, uh, the mathematics of this was worked out when I was at Utah with Ivan Sutherland. And uh, you should be able to write it down in a few hundred lines of code and get modern modern graphics. Well, nobody has done it until Dan Emelang here came along and did it in two parts. First one is just asking the question of, what is the actual involvement between a uh, an arbitrary polygon and a pixel? And so here's a new kind of formula that computes that involvement directly without super sampling or anything. And here's a language you came up with called Nile. Not in small talk, but in Nile, sort of like an APL language that is heavily mathematical that in 45 lines of code it say can do this kind of render. So that's pretty good for 45 lines of code, but it's not enough to do the graphics that you experience on your personal computer. So the next idea is to think about um, compositing. So here we see compositing uh, of one kind, and there are about uh, 26 compositing operations that are used on the Mac and the PC. And in this one, this is a 10 to 95 line of code. And but then there's pen stroking. So pen stroking is, is like this. And that comes to uh, another 95 line of code. And but we've got things like uh, gradients and other kinds of things. And a good way of showing gradients here is to, is to come out here. And uh, if we pick one of these guys here, um, and we say we want to look at its gradient so it's now using the user interface on itself as opposed to the user interface is live also. I can start playing with the, uh, the gradient here, make a different gradient. Kind of like that. Okay, so that all takes about 71 lines of code to do, and uh, Gaussian shadows and other kinds of things, and other hundred and so on lines of code. So, whole graphic system here for this personal computing model I'm showing you is uh, 435 lines of code. That's it. 
So this compares to maybe 500,000 lines of code to a million lines of code in Cairo. So it's about a factor of a thousand smaller than um, the kind of code you're going into in C or C++. In this case. And this represents something more like an act, like the act, accurate entropy of this uh, of this task here. Okay, but of course, uh, language on paper is one thing. You have to uh, implement it. And to do that, you can make use of a single uh, of a simple transformation language. The one we did is called Ometa, and here's Alex Ward who did it. And so Ometa basically translates arbitrary structures into arbitrary structures. It doesn't care whether they're strings or not. And um, um, once we have these, we can do a variety of things, as I'll, I'll, as I'll show you in a second. And to make this graphics language, it takes about 130 lines of code to represent the syntax, and to make it run fast enough to show you this presentation, uh, it takes another 730 lines of code to do the transformations necessary to make it efficient. So we're still doing pretty well, because we've, uh, we're still about 1,500 lines of code. We have to make the transformation language and uh, that takes a, about 100 lines of code. And these are the things that small, the, the original small duck was actually an extensible language that had some of these features in it. And they got progressively removed uh, as parts moved along and more and more conventional programming was done in it. But I just thought I'd show you these things to keep your interest. So it really does make a difference, even though small talk is nice, et cetera, et cetera. It really makes a difference to be able to write your programs in the terms of the semantics that the programs are trying to represent. And Brett Victor, who's a young, super talented uh, uh, user interface designer, has been consulting with us. And when he looked at uh, denial language, he said, well, you should be able to visualize that. Uh, in, in some sort of automatic way to try and understand how these small programs actually work. So he actually did, uh, did something like this. I don't know if you can see that. So this is live here. So here's the, here's the uh, Bezier Swan definition of I'll make it into a B here. You see, as I'm running the, the mouse over here, it's actually generating down through here. And here's the program that's actually being done. I can pick anything in here, any place, forwards and backwards. How does this pixel happen? Happen here. Uh, what if I open this up now and uh, I can see this whole pipeline of things that are being done going right from the beginning of this thing all the way down here. And I asked, so I was pretty impressed with this, and I asked Victor, I said, how much work was this? And he says, well, it wasn't any work because this whole visualization was computed automatically from the Nile abstract syntax trees. And then I was really impressed. Because when you make a new language, is you can actually set it up so that you can create visualization of what the processes are in these languages more or less automatically. It completely changes uh, what it takes to actually make and learn a new language that's super expressive like this. Okay, so, yeah, so my thought is, gee, when we, when we go to small talk or something else in the future, what we really want is something like uh, what the mathematicians have done to themselves in Mathematica. So they have done a system that not only has a programming language in it, but it actually knows a lot about mathematics. So small talk and hardly any, I, think, I can't even think of a programming language today that really knows a lot about programs. Small talk is there as a material, but it doesn't have any knowledge that it can apply automatically on your behalf except for simple optimization. So in Mathematica, uh, you've got uh, programs within Mathematica that are these C++ 
solutions for you. You get programs that automatically generate visualizations. I saw that Victor stuff. I was thinking, yeah, that's the next step in programming is we have to get from the hows to the what's, and then we have to go to this you know, system that is more like this that allows us to uh, deal with this age-old idea of being able to deal with programming in terms that our brains can actually handle. So I say we need a programmatica. I'll just put that forth as a, a name of the language yet to be done. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip past this and get to the end here because I'm just about out of time. So here's a joke that I think will work uh, that is popular in computing in the United States back in the 60s. It has to do with turkeys. Uh, turkeys are everywhere in the world, right? There are turkeys in Argentina. No? No turkeys? Yes? Yes, turkeys? Okay, but turkeys are an unusual bird because notice these turkeys are wandering around here uh, and there's just a small fence over here and these turkeys can fly over that fence. So they can escape anytime they want. Why don't they escape? The answer is the turkey, turkey's brain has a piece missing. So for a low obstacle, the turkey thinks it's a walk. And so for low things, the turkey tries to walk around the log. And for really high things, uh, the turkey brain says fly over. So if you pick something just about this high, the turkey will think it's a log. And these turkeys are just waiting for Thanksgiving <laughs> to get away, but in fact, they aren't going to get away because they are imprisoned by their own minds. And you can imagine in computing that we have this problem. Right? We see things that seem to be obstacles, and so we wander around. And every once in a while we think of doing something about it, and one turkey says to the other, hey Joe, let's take another run at the fence. And of course the turkey can't get out by taking a run at the fence. Every once in a while, there's a tiny little turkey down at the bottom and says, well, can't we just fly over it? And the answer is, yeah, you can fly over it, but you have to decide how to fly. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, maybe there's a, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. I've been programming for four or five years before then, and I really didn't 
I had a really stupid idea of a computer. I thought it was that thing in the glass house that you put pump cards into. When I saw Sketchpad, I suddenly understood what the thing was, and I just went crazy with the joy. Um, so the other, the, the answer to your question is that there's two parts to it. So the simple answer is, well, a lot of those people are in biology right now. Because it wasn't anything special about us. Uh, the difference was uh, that the funding back then in computing was perfect for people like us. And today the funding in computing is terrible for people like us. And so people who are, like, I, I certainly wouldn't go into computing. If I were an undergraduate right now, I wouldn't go into computing. I'm not even sure I even wind up with a decent conception of computing as an undergraduate in, in computing. It certainly isn't taught in most places in the U.S. Um, and I almost did go back into biology uh, until I did see a set pad. When I saw a set pad, I realized, oh, there's a, there's a destiny here. And yeah, no destiny, I've been showing you things that haven't been done, even on the old ideas that are cosmic. Uh, we take three or four of the things that I mentioned today that have been hanging around, it would be as cosmic as the internet to allow real uh, semantic coordination between uh, uh, migrating modules. That would be enormous. And there's many more things to be done in the user interface. I mean, it really hasn't gotten started yet. So, uh, uh, so I think I think the the other question is is uh, the other answer is uh, Jack Park, for instance, only had 25 people, and in computing today, uh, looking at the entire world, it's easy to find 25 people of the same ability. They're just a smaller percentage now. In fact, you can find 10 Xerox parts without any trouble over the entire world. You can find one in Argentina, I guarantee you. You, know, you can find them. So, um, but because there isn't a community that look like it's set up, it's harder to find them. It was easy to stop Xerox Park because uh, Lookalite and the, the other funders that ARPA had funded, all, all of our PhDs have been funded by then. They already knew who we were. We were all young. I was the oldest at Jack Park, I was 30. And Butler Lanson was 27 and, and so forth. So they, they knew it was easy. But today we have the internet. We can find people who are like this. Um, so I think that the, uh, the people I praise the most Every once in a while I get a medal for something. But I always say, look, you know, forget about this medal. You're giving the medal to the funders that funded us back then. That is the only reason that you want to give the new medal right now is because the funding was great back then. And, uh, you know, a few people were able to take advantage of it. And so whenever you change the funding, remember it's portfolio funding. So you don't want to take all of your R&D uh, resources for a whole country and put it into crazy stuff like this, but you think of five percent of it. In American dollars, Jurassic Park, American dollars today, Jurassic Park costs ten million dollars a year. And I'm sure that uh, uh, five percent of R&D is R&D budget uh, is more than ten million American dollars a year. So the real thing here is this is the turkey problem. Right? People are always finding reasons not to do things they can perfectly well do. For instance, in the U.S., there are super control problems. Funders in the U.S. now feel that because they're responsible, they should also control. 
but they don't have the wisdom and the knowledge to control it, so when they try to control it, just kills them. Some of the control is such that you can't even write a decent proposal anymore. So those are huge problems in the U.S., but these are simple because you just have to have an enlightened person who is not fired for a couple of years, and uh, you will get good things happening. Second part. And the second question is, what should 
What do you consider is the worst mistake that a programmer can make and should avoid in his career? I think that the, you know, the traditional, the, the problem with ideas is that most of them are mediocre down to bad. And so you have to have a lot of ideas to uh, hone in on a good one. And we have to have something to do with these, all these ideas that we're having. And so one piece of advice is, well, is, to, is find, find a way to do something with the ideas that you're having that allows you to have more before you commit to implementing them. So most people uh, are commit too early to an idea that usually isn't good enough and they usually uh, start trying to optimize the idea before they even understand whether it's worth it. So those, so this is kind of like, you know, like uh, great hot food. <laughs> yeah, cooking is a wonderful idea, but you know you don't want to put both hands into the soup. That's just eat hot food with somebody, with some respect, and then you get. Nurtured from it. And um, the, and I think the, uh, the other, one thing I learned, I think, um, is that, for instance, I think everybody realizes that do real things in computing, you need a, a team. And like a good basketball team or baseball team, everybody has to be able to play the basic game, but you also want people who are different in abilities and can do different kinds of things. And then if uh, you can get along the right way, you can get huge synergies by exploiting these differences. And the thing I didn't realize when I was at Xerox Park was, you know, I realized one thing was that I had hired, found people who were good at completing. I was pretty good at starting. So I honed in on people who, were, who could do what better than I was at getting complete. But then I got upset later on because they were trying to complete. I wanted to change the long talk. I wanted to get rid of it because it was done. And uh, so it took me a while to realize that, yeah, just don't fight it. Let the completers complete. Start another group. And this works both ways. So, so I had already I had done everything that I was going to contribute to small talk in just in the first couple of years. And much of What's good and much of what's there in small talk is due primarily to Dan Eagles. He was the one who made it useful in a dozen different ways. And Adenal Goldberg was huge in being able to get it done and out and all of that stuff. And the um, and you know, thank goodness we're friends today. We're all friends. But back then, I was always saying, well, you know, forget about this. <laughs> you know, if that had stayed, get rid of it. Let's do the next one. But what I should have done is just said, oh, boy, thank you for still being interested in this. Uh, I'm going to go start another group. And we'll just get another set of completers. And I think that's, that's the right way uh, to do this. Because what you really want to do, what you don't want to do is oppose people's natural tendencies. You, know, you don't want to stop a completer. It hurts them. And also, you do not uh, want to keep an idea person around too long. They actually are uh, detrimental to the rest of the process because they keep on having ideas. 
But the last thing you need once you've got a fairly good one that you're working on. Okay, so uh, thanks once again. I have to have to leave now, but it was a real pleasure talking to you. <laughs>